All right. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. So one of the things I want to show you, and I notice a lot of these videos don't, but they mention that the uh, information is stamped into the ring gear. And you see right here, you see manufacturer's information. All right. So you see like a part number, a date of manufacturer. It was a Dana. Dana's the one that built it. There's a, like a like a lot number maybe, serial number. But the two numbers you want to actually get go for are these two numbers right here, 42 and 12. If you take 42, the first number, and divide it by the second number, you will find that it come that it, that is what your gear ratio will be. And this is a 350 gear ratio. And do the math. 42 divided by 12 is three and a half. So this indicates it's a 350 gear ratio. Now another method that you can use, and this is I find it easier, instead of trying to figure out how many times this gear spins to one spin of this, or how many times this spins to one spin of this. You can count the teeth. Yeah, so you can mark, take a paint mark or something, and mark a tooth, rotate it around, and count all the teeth. And you do the same thing on the pinion, and you take the bigger number, divide it by the smaller number. So your ring gear is always going to be the bigger number. Your pinion gear in the back there is always going to be a smaller number. And that's exactly what these two numbers denote. It's 42 teeth on the ring gear and 12 teeth on the pinion. And these are matched sets. They are machined matched. You cannot swap these out with other gear ratios or other gears. These have to be sold as a, or installed as a pair. All right. So because of, especially these being used now, but as they're actually machined, they're actually machined as a pair, so you can't switch them out. They have to be replaced as a pair. That's why whenever you go to get a new ring gear for your differential, it comes with a new pinion. Yeah, so if you want to get see how an open differential works, if you see the stub shaft isn't moving. As I rotate the pinion, you see that the side gears are starting to move, and or the spider gears are moving. And you can see, clearly see, that this side gear is moving, allowing that wheel to spin while this one stays. That, how, why they do that is so that way one tire will spin faster than the other as you make a turn. So what a limited slip does is when you're going straight, clutches will lock in on either side and provide equal torque to both sides. But on ideal conditions, and it's the same ideal conditions, the clutches will slip or disengage, allowing one wheel to spin faster than the other. But if the one wheel starts to slip, the clutches will engage, putting full power, equal torque to both sides. All right, so you get the benefits of a locker and the benefits of an open differential at the same time compared to having just a regular locker or a spool setup where power is on either you know, is divided between the two sides and you can end up chirping your tires and having bad road manners. Now... I know one of the big questions some of the newer viewers that are coming into automotive work, especially with 4x4s, is going to ask is how difficult is it to convert an open differential carrier to a limited slip? Uh, that's a good question, and I see that question in the comment sections all the time and on the forums. And it's, simple, it's honestly as simple as this. Once you get it to this stage, you know, and if you have a a differential that's got a removable back cover. All you have to do is remove that cover and drain the fluid and remove these bolts, pull the caps off, and then actually pull the carrier out. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the ring gear off of this open carrier and you're going to swap it over to a carrier that's set up with a limited slip and then you're going to reset the gears. And that is a process that I'm not going to explain right now. But one of the big things is, is you want to mark these caps. All right. And these caps, just like on an engine, they have to go back on in the same exact manner on the same side that they come off of. Because like an engine, they are a precision machine together. So you can't take this cap off and put it over here. And you can't and take you, this you cap can't, off and flip, flip it. it. And you can't flip them around. They've got to be exactly here. And then one of the tricks you can do is you can take a punch and you can punch a dot. And you can even punch a dot right here and you line them up. So that way you know you're putting the cap on in the same spot in the same direction. On this side, you put two dots and then two dots. Now, obviously, you're not going to want to do anything here on the machine surface because this is where the gasket's going to sit. Otherwise, if you're going to you, have If you can tell, you got a stamp right there. So you can, Yeah, but look at how far in that stamp is from the edge. You yeah. want a good edge. Well, look right here. You can stamp right there on this edge where this rust line is and still be able to line that up. Not to mention... 
they do have no. You can put a, a thin film, a thin film of RTV around these surfaces here, and and be able to actually seal it. We'll we'll show you that as we. Speaking of which, I don't recall there being a gasket on this when I took it off. It's probably stuck to the I beam. Probably is, but if you look right here, you got a stamp right there, right in dead center of the sealing surface. So RTV would be a must on something like this. You'd have to put RTV on the gasket or put a thin layer around this as you're setting it on the in the carrier or in the I beam itself. So with that being said, that's that's one of the big critical things. And the other thing is, is you would have to buy a dial indicator and a magnetic base so that way you can set your backlash. Now where your gears are and bearings are used, and if you're gonna reuse those bearings, which if you're gonna replace the carrier, I suggest you replace the, the carrier bearings. All right. That's going to be a given. All right. You set the uh, dial indicator up on the top tooth here, on one of these top sections of the tooth of the ring gear. All right. You can even do it from the bottom if you wanted to, but as long as it's on on a surface here on the teeth, and what you're actually measuring is what is called gear backlash. All right. The amount. See here that that knocking. That's the t that's the backlash, and you can't just grab it and feel it. All right, because there's no way you're going to fill a couple thousandths of an inch. And what I mean by couple is most gear sets are actually set between five and I've seen as high as 16 thousandths of an inch. General backlash setting for this particular type of differential, no matter the gear ratio you're running, you'll want to follow the, the manufacturer's recommendations, but I've generally seen them anywhere between five and eight, eight to, I five think, 12 to eight, thousandths. Five to eight thousandths on these Dana 44s on average. <laughs> so follow the manufacturer's recommendations uh, when setting your backlash. And how you set your backlash is some differentials will have shims that go, if you're shimming what is called outboard, your shims will actually go in between the carrier bearing and the case. Which this one's got them. If you're shimming inboard, you're actually going to put shims in between the bearing and the carrier. And this is where a setup bearing comes in because it's a bearing that's not pressed on and it just slips on. And you would slip that on with your shim pack, install this, and this is where it becomes very time-consuming and monotonous because of how many times you're going to be pulling this carrier in and out to get your gear, your shim set right. All right, and basically on your if you're... you're uh, Backlash is too loose, that means your ring gear is actually too far this way, which means your, your gears, your teeth are not meshing all the way. And if you're too tight, it means your gears are too far into each other, too far into this surface, and you're too tight. So you got to have that set just right. And then, obviously, pinion depth, which is also set by shims, also sets your wear pattern. So once you get your backlash You're going to want to check your wear pattern two ways. You're going to want to check it initially here, which is the drive surface. And then you want to check it on the backside, which is the coast surface. And if you're on a rear differential, all right, it's actually going to be the opposite. Your drive surface is going to be here. Your coast is going to be here. I could be wrong. All right, so don't quote me on that. All right, but either which way, you're going to, you're going to take some, uh, some of that yellow... Uh, which comes in a lot of the kits, that yellow acid paint, you're going to paint a couple of teeth, you're going to rotate it around, and that's and that's going to get on the pinion gear, and it's going to show you where your wear pattern is. And you want your wear pattern to be center this way, all right, from the center to the edge of the teeth. You're going to want that centered there. But you're also going to want to have it also centered here. So you want to basically have it set smack dab in the center of each tooth, both left to right, forward and aft. So, at this point right now, you're going to finish cleaning the scuzz off your fingers. I'm going to pass you to cam your eye. And I'm going to get in here and see if I can get that pin out. This is a, a type of E-clip. It's not a C-clip, it's an E-clip, and I'll show you why. Somewhere around here, I've got a piculation. <coughs> it's flexing way too much. So, a small 
scrounge driver is in order. Not big enough. Well, so I guess my little snap-on pocket screwdriver ain't gonna be big enough. This can do the trick. Watch, I shoot this clear across the premises. Oh, me eye. I got it to move. Now let's do this for moving. Ah! Okay, slightly bigger now that I've got it loose. That's too small. That's just right. I knew I'd shoot it out somewhere. So Okay, goes. so it looks like a C clip. But that is an E clip. It looks like an E. Yeah. So I can go ahead and remove that there stub shaft. <coughs> now I did check with the other drive shaft. This is a 31 spline. And the hub end is a what did I say it was? 21 spline? 19 spline? Yeah, 19 spline. So one of the other things you want to look for, obviously, in something like this is U joint. Bearing surface or Which seal that surface. One actually looks pretty good. And then you want to check for obvious signs of wear on your splines. So with so that this one actually looks pretty good. So this one I would probably deem salvageable. So I might clean that up, de-rust it, change out the U-joint, maybe see if I can get a replacement boot and uh, reuse that. Scuzzy. So, that being said, that's pretty much all I have, just doing some basic overview and explaining of... Uh, what goes on inside a differential, how to identify certain things, things like that. Just, just some basic information. We will go more in depth as we continue to tear this apart. And trust me, on my channel at Gearheads, uh, we're going to be doing, obviously, an engine rebuild. And, you know, we're probably going to be doing a Super Duty axle swap on uh, Project Resurrection. So I see some markings on the face of the pinion. Yeah, I saw that too. It says number 157. And then obviously we got a lot of the projects we're going to be doing over here on uh, Dr. Franken truck. Yeah, here soon we're going to be tackling Green and Nasty. Green and Nasty needs to have a bed liner cut out. Obviously, needs some new tail lights. I'm waiting on new sockets. And I've already got the new buckets and bulbs. And uh, it looks like it's going to piss on us. Just a little bit. But, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to operate the zoom here. Press and hold. Got it. Okay. Zoomed. <laughs> okay. So, uh, those are some things that are coming up the pike. Uh, as soon as I get Trump money in, yay, Trump, uh, I'm actually going to be probably using some of that money to possibly buy me... To buy me some engine parts so we can get These going. These caps are already pre-marked, so you can't screw up the orientation. If so you look closely, look at that tick right there. Same tick is right here. So I can tell you right now, somebody's been in this. So here's that tick, and there's that tick. Yep, somebody's been in this because those are not factory. Somebody has been in and rebuilt this before. So yes, this appears as though it may already have been rebuilt half hazardly i don't think it was rebuilt properly what makes you say that well number one looking at the driver's side axle shaft when i pulled it out at how decimated that thing is and i can show you that yeah you remember in this uh, last vi last set of videos one of them cut out because he ran out of uh, memory. So we're going to show you the aftermath of what he found. So there's one half. That's actually the good, fairly good side. So one thing I can tell you about these U-joints is looking at that, 
that looks flattened and wallered out. But that, right there, that is, no, that is not salvageable. So this is going to need to definitely be replaced. So, that's junk. Take it back. This looks pretty good, except there's that little wore down spot right there that's got me concerned. So this shaft may wind up getting replaced. be honest with you, Chris, I'd replace them both. Yeah, but if I do that, I might as well replace both sides, all components, except this here. Like I said, this actually looks like it's in really good shape. This may have actually even been replaced when this was rebuilt. So I'd say I'm probably going to de-rust this, paint so this, it, put new joints in it. Yeah, this stub shaft looks really good. I mean, just see some seal, seal wear right there. But as long as it doesn't have a noticeable lip on it, you should be fine. Yeah. So I might even salvage that boot. This is the passenger side. Which give it a good cleaning up, and I'd say that actually looks pretty good. From what I can see here, the splines look good. Splines look good. This surface here looks good. That's where the seal rode, and that feels pretty good. The rest of the shaft looks pretty good. But if I'm, I'm going to replace this entire setup, and I probably will replace this one as well. But I'll probably salvage this end of the shaft. So, I foresee new shafts and new joints in my future. Not in the near future, because uh, this is pretty much probably going to be the end of this right now, until further notice, until he can get this on the road piece of kit here, all road legal and, and stuff, which we're going to be doing videos on that. So, hey, doctor, why don't you tell him what's up the pike for uh, Green and Nasty? Well, uh, aside from the... coat of paint it needs brakes all around wheel bearings all around uh, there's an exhaust system in dire need of repair and a transmission that's got to be drained have fresh drain plug and fill plug put back into it because I used the wrong ones and probably go through and grease the chassis so, those of you who uh, have managed to come over to my channel and view some of my videos, we did uh, a couple summers ago, about, I think, three summers ago, so probably 2017, we uh, showed a basic brake uh, rep repair video, full brake job, on his other truck, Floyd, where we replaced the calipers and the pads and the lines. All right, I got a two-part series on my channel, so uh, we're going to go through and do a more in-depth brake video on this where we're actually going to replace the rotors, the wheel bearings, the hub, you know, the uh, wheel seals, things like that, Doing a, basically replacing this unit. I think I'm going to make a jig All right. for this. On this, along with the calipers and stuff. So to get a kind of an idea on how these F-250s come apart, and go back together you can watch those over at my channel it's gearheads with the z and uh we'll go through and do a little more in-depth uh video here as soon as he gets the parts and uh maybe have a better camera setup than just our cell phones so you got anything else to add there doctor so if you like the videos like comment share and definitely subscribe I know in my first video I mentioned that I didn't really care about that, but you know what? I'm new to YouTube, and this is turning out to be pretty fun. So, like I said, like, comment, and subscribe to uh, Dr. Frankentruck. Check out Gearheads, see what he's got going on over on his channel. And as always, I'm Dr. Frankentruck, and I'll see you next time on the operating table. And I'm Gear and I'm Maniac Mechanic at Gearheads and I'll see you at my channel. Be sure to rate, comment, subscribe on mine. Trust me, we got a lot of stuff coming up the pike. We'll see you then.